Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the source of all things. And Lord Jesus, you are the source of every right impulse. We just pray that as we gather here this evening that your angels would press in about us. We just wish to welcome all the angels of the begotten Son, Michael and his angels. And Father, that you would speak to us. We know that we are living in very, very interesting times. And we know that soon that this world will end. And we, we choose to believe that you have given us all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And that we are now filling our vessels with oil. While the, shops is, the shop which dispenses oil is available. So that we will not be left without oil. Guide us tonight, Father, through your spirit. I thank you that you will. In Jesus' name. So, just praying and thinking about the best way to present, uh, and we're getting we're getting a lot of mileage out of the five uh, the, the five key areas of lies of the Pentagon, the five lies system, and. Uh, for those that, I think most of us were here on Sabbath, those of us who are here this afternoon, we're going over this, the, um, the five points. Remember what the five points were at all? Character of God. We've, we've, we've redefined that COG, character of God. It's like the right of, sorry? Trinity. Trinity. And connected to the Trinity is the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ. What was another one? Law and covenant. Law and the covenants. And the two pillars. The two bottom ones. Sabbath or Sunday. We'll put it in the negative. And. What's the other? Mortality. Uh, the modern word I use for that is life source. So this afternoon we spent some time on the character of God in reference to Agape. Agape, God is Agape. And we combine that with uh, 1 John 1, 5, where it says that God is light. God is agape. God is light. So light is agape. Uh, and uh, uh, darkness is the opposite, which we looked at, which was eros. Eros and agape is a giving love, a love that gives without any uh, effort made to draw. And eros is like a black hole. Just sucks everything in towards itself. And then we made the connection between the character of God and uh, we spent time looking at the begotten Son. And for those that were with us, why is the begotten Son so critical to the principle of Agape? What's the connection between Agape and the begotten Son? The inheritance. The inheritance. And why is that? Because he got everything from the father. So the father didn't have any. He wasn't attracted to the son because the son had something to offer him. Okay. So through the, the complete inheritance or all things, John 3.35, God gave all things to his son. So it's the inheritance that proves that God is a Garpy. That he gave everything that he had to his son, and that because the son was begotten, this proves that the son had nothing of himself. When he was brought forth from the father, it was all coming from the father. So this is what draws the link between uh, Agape, the character of God, and the begotten son. And of course, we saw how that the Trinity destroys the concept of the begotten Son, which destroys the concept of Agape. So, the Trinity destroys the character of God. It destroys the Agape of God. 
And as we read in the book, uh, we read from the final chapter of My Beloved, where the Pope says that God is Eros, combined with the Garpy. Uh, and that's, that's uh, another whole subject. But uh, one text I want to come back to. Now, I now want to make a link down to the immortality of the soul. We've gone from character of God to begotten Son. Now I want to show an, another link uh, between character of God. So we've gone that way. We'll go down this way. And we might even bring it down this way as well. But all these are interconnected in their, in their system to keep you enslaved within this five-point system. The immortality of the soul teaching. That's where we want to go now. Uh, I was meditating upon let's rub that off again. John 5.26. Let's go there and read that. John 5.26. So we have this situation in John 5.26 where God has life in himself and he gives to the Son to have life in himself. And uh, it was as I was meditating and I diagrammed this out and I was thinking about this, about the relationship of life and where life comes from and how we obtain life and how that the Son, the begotten Son, um, was given to have life in Himself. So He received His life from His Father, but He was given to have it within Himself. And I was, I was uh, thinking about, uh, from a human perspective, and this is where we come to the second chapter of the Book of Life Matters, where I explore how people think about where life comes from. And we came up with three... Uh, basic models uh, and there was the model of God having life uh, has his own life <coughs> and man has his own life completely unrelated to God uh, or somehow connected to God like in the idea of pantheism that life, everyone just has life God is life, life is God and we're all just connected to it so uh, this is this is an independent system, um, a pagan system. So you, you have your own life source, God has his own life source. And I began to think about what are the implications for relationship when two people are independently connected to one another? How does that affect life source? And then I thought on the other side how that the Bible teaches about the mortality of man and uh, that God has life and what are some texts we can think about that describe the relationship between God and man and life? Uh, in Him we live and move and have our being. In Him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17, 24, I think. Seventeen twenty eight. Yeah, twenty eight. Um, for in him we live and move and have our being. Talks about in other verses about cease from man whose breath is in his nostrils. Man is a vapor that is here for a little while and then disappears. In him all things consist. So we, we have this third relational system where life uh, is being streamed from God to man constantly. And I was simply asking myself the question, what, is, what do each of these three relationships, what do each of these three models of life do to relationships as to how we would relate to one another? 
And that's, that's, ba that's the basic principle of this book. And it was while I was, and I, I just share a little point here, it was while I was writing the second chapter of this book, and you can see the diagram I've got it, I've put it in there, the three models, that that's, that's uh, when I, I had a revelation of, uh, I thought it came to me when I drew up this diagram, and I heard, I heard, I believe I heard the voice of Jesus say to me, he said, I am the middle column. And he was given to have life in himself. And I thought, wow, how does that affect the relationship? And then I thought, but we're in the third column. We're not in the second column. But the whole, the whole Protestant and Catholic world believe that we are the middle column. Because we have the immortality of the soul. Man is given his own life. He has his own life source. And so great is the, the, the life that God has given that God cannot even destroy you. He can only make you suffer in hell forever. He can't actually get rid of you. Is that what they mean? They're really asking you a really dumb question. That is what they really, that's what Catholics and Protestants believe. You burn in hell forever. But do they believe what you just said about the life source? Well, that it, they have life in themselves and that they well, can't. Immortality of the soul, that's what it means. Means that God has given them a permanent gift of life <coughs> that they can destroy. It. Not that they would word it that way. No, that's. that's... <laughs> do you, but do you, do you you understand how that if someone is is still alive while they're in hell, where will have it's because they believe they have life in themselves. They have this immortal life. They they cut off from God, but they're still alive. How can this be? Except that this doctrine of the immortality of the soul. And so, peace uh, off, just for yeah. uh, like, uh, I was going to read Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having accepted the corruption that is in the world through us. Having given us the divine nature. He's given us the divine nature. In Christ, but this is about life. So you were gonna, yeah. You, as an ex-Catholic, um, you get into this dilemma. Um, either, either God is um, so cruel that He's keeping somebody alive and torturing them, or they have their own source and God can't stop it. They're the they're the only two options you we have. Either God's keeping them alive in in burning. Mm. which we as yeah. Christians who've read the Bible realise that's not the case, or we think that these people actually have their own life source. Mm. Mm. That their soul is immortal, mm. and it cannot die. Mm. And God can't even extinguish it. Mm. Mm. it, it it's, a, it's a powerful thing to think. Mm. And but if, don't you believe that God gave them the source? or It's a gift. Yeah. It's a gift that so God, God gives. gives it, but he can't take it back. But, well, I don't know if they think that far, but it's just that the soul is immortal and it cannot die. It kind of polarizes, it makes people either very afraid and serving God out of fear, or very rebellious and not caring about it at all. Okay, so, uh, unbelievable. so now we're getting some relational implications of what we believe about life and how we relate to God. And, ha and we want to take this a step further as to how we would relate to each other. If we each have our own life source, what you just described there in terms of our relationship with God, could similar things happen in our relationships with each other if we each have our own life source? And these are, the, these are the simply the questions I began to ponder in my mind about how life, where we believe life comes from and how we have it, affects our relationships. Life and relationships. And that, that, was, the, that was the journey of life matters. And, and it's the double meaning there of life does matter and matters about life. And, and I, there's the double, double uh, meaning in the book there. And what was interesting for me is that after I had finished writing the second chapter of Life Matters, I had an explosion of thought which uh, came about into the book Return of Elijah. The book Return of Elijah came out of the second chapter of Life Matters. That's how it came about. 
because I was thinking about all these things and it was just, wow, well that means this and that means this. And that's when I was up at two in the morning and all the dots were connecting and I had to get up and, and write about it. So, um, just reinforcing again this principle about what the, what the Bible teaches. Jesus says, for without me you can do what? Nothing. John 15, 5 tells us that. There's so many verses about uh, when it says, dust thou art. Such a simple verse, isn't it? So we want to think about what, what, what is ours? Dust. That's what we are. Without the life of God, without the breath of God, we're just dust. Dust thou art, and dust to dust thou shalt return. That's a pretty heavy text. But there's so many texts in the Bible that, that tell us this in terms of a biblical understanding. And we'll come back to this again in the, the Identity Wars. Uh, if, if this concept of life comes up again, and I'm just... Just connecting, second chapter of Identity Wars, the fountain of life. So it, this was the, the, the beginnings of dealing with this issue of life source and where life comes from and, and how intimately connected we are to God. So, um, what, uh, what then we, we want to ask, well, I'm just briefly... We looked at uh, a number of models like uh, Eastern thought. I just want to read you a couple of quotes about Eastern thought. The greatest exponent of the philosophy of the Vedas, that's the Hindu Vedas of Eastern thought, which is also called Vedanta, man is divine. That's the Eastern principle, that man is divine. Uh, we're, we're, we're partakers of the divine nature. Well, the Eastern philosophy is that man is divine. Period. That's that's the Eastern philosophy. Okay. Hence why they would seek after the good. Yeah. You've got to bring it out. You've got to develop it. Uh, and as long as you uh, must stay, the God in me brings the God in you. Oh. Is that a quote? Well, no. They say like when they greet you, the Namaste. Ah. Means the God in me greets the God in you. There you go. It's wow. the Eastern, the Eastern philosophy. Rather meets the road, pagan worship to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, and in the the, the Catholic, the, the Western, the Catholic Protestant view of life is very much influenced by the Greeks, and this is why the beast in Revelation 13 is predominantly a leopard beast, which is coming from Greece. Uh, and this is, this is part of this life source principle. Uh, this is from the Catholic Catechism. How can we prove that the soul of man is immortal? We can prove that the soul of man is immortal because man's acts of intelligence are spiritual. Therefore, his soul must be a spiritual being, not dependent on matter, and hence not subject to decay or death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, show me the Bible text Back set up, thank you. That's what I call red fire engine logic. <laughs> you, you familiar with that? No. My car is red, fire engines are red, my car is fire engine. You get that? <laughs> now there's, well you see a similarity and so you draw a conclusion without more information. You leave information out and then you can draw whatever conclusions you like. Uh, so, uh, the Catholic and Protestant view is that man is immortal. The Eastern view is that man is, um, is divine. And so we, we have essentially the, the three different models in the pagan or the, the, the pantheistic view that, uh, that man is divine. In the middle view you have that man is immortal. And in the last view, man is mortal. Now, um, and in each in each uh, each case, you, you're attributing where your life is coming from. Uh, how did I word that? Let me just. 
The first model, man has an inherent life source, the divine, that originates within himself. The second model, man is given a life source by God, the divine, that he possesses within himself. Man receives through a relationship with God, the divine, outside of himself. So, in each these two models here, you have life uh, in yourself, either whether it's given to you or whether uh, you have it naturally within yourself, uh, you seeing that you have your own life source. Now that has a dramatic impact upon the way that you relate to God. And Igor touched on this, and we can see that when we go to the, the book of Genesis, Satan was insinuating uh, one of these two systems. Uh, and this is the lie, this is the lie upon which the entire system of uh, Satan's kingdom is built. That's why in the Pentagon, it will tell the soul is one of its pillars. It's also the way that you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Do you believe God breathed into his mouth once? Or does God continually keeps, keeps him alive? The Jews say um, he is our breath. <clears throat> so. So, Ruach is the spirit, mm -hmm. which is the breath. That's the way they tell it. Yeah, so, so it comes down to how do you read that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you read it? Is, is God just breathing to your nostril once and, and you're on your clock that just wipes down? Or is he constantly feeding your life? If he breathes once, then you're in this particular in here. But if he continues to breathe into you, that relation, constant relationship there with you. And it's interesting that Ellen White says that prayer is the breath of the soul. Like breath of the soul. Yeah. Because yeah. it's the praises going back to, as Steps to Christ says, praises going back through Christ, back up to the Father, that mm. circle of belief. Mm. If we're not linked to the divine, we'll die. That's it. So, um, <coughs> with. With these, um, these three models in mind, that's right, that's where we were going. We were going to look at the implications of uh, the lie, you shall not surely die. So, our first parents were influenced by these philosophies, either that life is in you through the fact that God is, uh, God is life, or that God has given, you've been given life and you have your own life source, and if you eat from the fruit of this tree, you're going to be able to maintain it yourself, and therefore your relationship with God is optional. It's optional. But one of the first signs of this new system of thinking, because they were told in Genesis 3, 5, you shall not surely die, you have life in yourself. Uh, and then when, when God approaches... Adam, in verse 10. What happens? Adam hides. What does he say? That he's naked? What does, what does he say? He felt. Fear. So this, the, the, the fruit, the fruit of the lie, lie equals fear. Now, we're, we were talking earlier this afternoon in 1 John chapter 4 where it says perfect love cast out fear. Okay, so perfect love casts out lies. Perfect, perfect love casts out lies. Both not giving you a spirit of fear. So power of love and a sound mind. The truth shall make you free. Yeah, I suppose that's why the cross is the central because that's where perfect love is most clearly. Mm -hmm. And this is where we, we come back to the agape again, where if you have if you have received everything and are receiving everything and continue to receive everything, and you believe that and you know that and you know that your life is in God and not in yourself, are you going to be afraid? Mm -hmm. But if if you have if you have your own life source here, and then this this big life source.
comes to little life source and he's bearing down on you, it's going to be, whoa! Well, could, well it, it's like, okay. And then, if you have your own life source, and then this life source says, I've got this thing called the Ten Commandments. Guess what? You're keeping them. What are you going to do? <laughs> you can't work on it. Sorry? You can't work on it. Well, you, you're, you're either going to go, all right, I'm going to keep this, or you're going to say, well, who do you think you are telling me what to do? I'm God myself. I don't need you to tell me what to do. Sounds like a teenager. Interesting. Who is the Lord? That I should obey him. That's evidence of a lie that's occurring. How does a two-year-old get this lie into their brain? <coughs> they inherit it. <laughs> Nobody wanted to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> that was too. So once once the life source shifts. Um, and then there's an introduction of the commandments, and this is this is what we go through in the early chapters of Life Matters. The the great problems that this creates for understanding the commandments, for understanding uh, how we relate to God and how we should deal with Him. Uh, and I'm just going to now take this to, to a slightly different level. And let's just talk in terms of um, I'll bring out some of these, just some of the diagrams in the, in the book. So if we have a, a perception of uh, if this is this is God and uh, he has life just trying to put that diagram right. Um, back. There. You have this system where you, you, you accept, well, that should, he should be the biggest circle, really. He? So, and he's giving you guidance. Uh, he's telling you, these are my commandments. And so there's a relationship where there's a, uh, a be, because you have life here, it creates the feeling of restriction. How many how many times have you heard people say, "I feel restricted"? Mm -hmm. I feel because you've got this lie inside of your head. I have my own life. It's my life. I can do with my life what I wish. And so any any suggestions for guidance towards from God to us can be interpreted as interfering. Uh, and so it creates, it creates a feedback loop. Because God is bigger than us, um, in many cases people, um, how can I say, it's called, it's called passive resistance. We don't like it, we have to acknowledge, because for those of us who believe in God, we acknowledge He exists, uh, but we don't. We resent the fact that He's over our shoulder all the time, telling us what to do as we perceive it. And so there's a there's a there's a lot of passive resistance going on. What, how would passive resistance manifest itself? Is that like passive aggressive style of personality? It's like it's like. I, Procrastination. I can't. I can't help it. I can't. You know, it's just. You know, this is hard. It's hard. I'm doing the best I can. And I. I can't help it. Or you can get really subtle. Uh, subtle manipulation of. Um, I'm trying to think of different ways that I can. 
you start justifying mm. what you're doing. Mm. It's not, I know you've told me not to steal, but it's not, yeah. it's not that much, it's a paper clip, it's not a million dollars. Yeah. It's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. I'll bring it into the human realm of how this works because we can we can we can take this down a level and, and put that to parent and then we'll we'll really be able to get going with some examples in the, in this domain. Parent child. Let me give you a classic example. I say to my son, eat your veggies. <laughs> and what what happened? With my son, I don't like that. Though. Suddenly, he developed a phobia. He was very afraid to eat. He had text. He had texture problems with food, uh, and um, I, I, I then, still under the influence, probably of a false system, I began to exert a little bit of pressure, uh, and he was equal to the task <laughs> because then he threw up. And then I was defeated. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean by passive resistance. But, but you know the other thing about inheritance? That's exactly what I did to my father. When he, when he tried to make me eat Brussels sprouts when I was five years old. And I defeated him because I spewed them up. <laughs> I think God has a sense of humour because no, one of the foods I eat more than anything else is Brussels sprouts. <laughs> 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 you and me, Adrian. I love them. I, I used to hate them. So, well, when you get desperate, you got to, you know. So, but, and I, I've said this before, is that if you if you develop a way of resisting, and you you, you fabricate an idea of fear. Fear of certain foods to create a passive re resistance. That fear then becomes part of the identity of the child, and then they become enslaved to that fear. You understand what I'm saying? As in, uh, it turns into all kinds of fears and phobias. See, long after the parent is no longer in control of the situation, that, that because I've created a phobic environment, they live in that fear environment, and so it becomes a noose around, around the neck. Uh, so we can we can look at uh, several ways that relationships are affected when we, uh, <coughs> in terms of two life sources, in terms of like male and female each having their own life source, what does it do to the relationship? Well, that there's... Are you going to say something? No? no? That if this, this life source, he wants to attract the female, so he, uh, he displays, you have a display of something to attract. It goes both ways. It's a process of display, attraction, uh, and to to draw each other close together. But then, if you enter into a, into a union, you've got two life sources. The the question then is, how are these two life sources going to align themselves? How do they work together? Well, if they're two independent life sources, you will have uh, both of them seeking to. Um, dominate. If they are like, if they are equal to each other or in parallel with each other, they will join. But if they are opposing each other, it's like positive and negative, they won't. They'll repel each other. So you must have something that is either displaying attractiveness or something that they can move together and become one. Okay, so let's say the, the male and the female, they join together and then they have to make a decision. They have a certain amount of money in the bank, and they're, they're, they're a couple that, that share a bank account. Yes, well, in that one, normally they quite possibly would have independent bank accounts. Okay, so independent bank accounts. What, what, what? In some cases, that in some cases that becomes necessary, uh, because what can happen if there's one bank account and 
you, well, let's take it a step further. Uh, you want to do something together. And one wants to do one thing, the, the, the husband wants to do one thing, the wife wants to do another thing. What do you do if you don't agree? How do you resolve <coughs> the difference? What mechanisms are in place to agree? Compromise? You, come to, you have to come to some resolve or agreement between two to be able to keep both, both happy. Otherwise there's a trust issue one against the other, and then start to separate. So you must come to agreements and have that love relationship between the two to keep it going, otherwise you'll start to fall. And how do we do that? Oh we my God. Find a compromise. Manipulate each other to accept. Manipulate, okay. <laughs> okay, if you... If you if manipulate if another. <laughs> <laughs> do, do we see any of this happening in relationships? And is manipulation a good thing, or is it from the devil? Because that comes not from love, it comes from the other source of manipulation. Mm. Well, we were just we were at Desire of Ages tonight, and we were just talking about um, Canaan, the first miracle, and how Mary tried to use the influence with Jesus, because she was his mother, she thought, well, I should be able to have some power or control mm. over him, and he was more. very respectful to her, but he's, mm. he made her realise that he's business was his father's business and then as Ellen Watt says no earthly relationship would have preeminence over his father. So that particular situation he didn't he didn't say Mum I'm thirty years of old age now, butt out. Yeah. He just went to her head and said, Our father, I must be about he my said, father. what have I to do with you, woman or something like that? Well, that's an, as I understand it, an Oriental mm -hmm. uh, expression. Um, I can't remember my how it's to be rendered. Not, my time has not yet come. Yeah. She was pushing. She wanted him to yeah. reveal that he was the Messiah so that she would get, oh, see, I was right all the time. But he was a respectful, it was a respectful answer. Mm -hmm. The Christ came. It was a respectful it's answer. Yeah, it's a... It's a... <coughs> Igor, you were going to say something. Uh, I remember some, what was the first miracle of Jesus? Yeah, yeah Cana. So had Mary actually realised? Yes. Sorry, how did? How did Mary realise that he could do something like that if it was the first miracle? Oh, she remembered the words that had been spoken to her. Um, well, A, when he went to the temple, and when they had lost sight of him for three days, and then they came back and he talked to them about what had happened. But also she remembered, as in Desire of Ages, she remembers what the, um, no, she remembered what the angel said to her, um, wasn't it about the, oh no, what um, Simeon said when he um, dedicated him as well, that's what she said. But she's exercising a lot of faith. Oh yes, but obviously, and I think Desire of Ages says it too, that she saw things throughout as he was growing up that he was different, that he was, you know, he was a normal child, but not a normal child, you know what I mean? So she knew that, but she wanted him to sort of do something to, to show her faith um, that he was the Messiah, as she can see it. Um, You're stepping out of line. So, um, this, this issue of, this, this comes to the very heart of the channel of blessing. How does, in a home environment, how does the male-female relationship relate? And that's... That's what I begin to discuss in the book Original Love. That's what Life Matters is about. Because so many relationships are about uh, two life sources that when there's, when there's two co-equal independent life sources that are, both have their own life, there is attraction to bring them close together in, in, order, to, in order to obtain things. But then when there's a, a sense that from either one, that one is trying to dominate the other uh, and the other is being forced to be a slave to the other, you get this repulsion effect as well. And that's, that's what happens to most family. You get this attraction-repulsion situation going on. Attraction-repulsion. Uh, and that's, uh, that's typically when both the male and the female are seeking to ascend into the sides of the north to be like, to be the most high within the family. When you put the two north poles together, 
they get pushed apart. But because there is a desire for intimacy, there is a desire for closeness, there is a desire for coming close, and so you come close, but because there is a pattern of thinking in the, in the individuals of life source, the two North Poles create repulsion. And this is where you get this incredible instability taking place in the, uh, in the relationship. And all of this has come about because of the lie, you shall not surely die. It, it has fundamentally altered our relationships with each other, and it has fundamentally altered our relationship with God. Uh, and uh, I'll just take that down. This is this is such a fundamental area to to understand how much that lie changed human relationships and human divine relationships. How it has affected. And fear, uh, when Adam says, I was afraid, I heard your voice, that was clear evidence that the lie of the serpent had, had taken control and, and, and Adam was running away, fearing, covering himself, doing all these things because of this lie that's now operating in his head. And it's simply, it's the tribal instinct of, of someone coming to, to attack me. Uh, and uh, he's just trying to defend himself. Okay, so we uh... actually he says um, uh, the verse that he said before. I'm wondering if that's um, connected to the divine nature. Usually we receive that when we believe in Christ, mm -hmm. and it's connected to these precious promises. And Christ said, the words that I speak are spirit and life. And so, like divine nature is connected to that everlasting life aspect. And we're dependent upon that from our Father. And that's that model of dependence again. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back to the dependence. That we, we realize that life is coming from outside of ourselves. Mm. And, and this is the whole... The whole principle of uh, when when we have an understanding of like of Christ who's come out of the Father and he uh, is given to have life in himself. Um, uh, but he recognizes that where his life has come from. He's always looking towards his Father. I do nothing of myself. And this is what's amazing about Christ, even though he's given to have life in himself. This is what I find interesting about the person of Christ, which is shows how how the divinity operates within him. Even though he's given this, he could act independently. He doesn't, mm -hmm. which is amazing. That he's constantly choosing to be submissive to his his Father and to to respond to him and to look to his father and to listen to his father's voice. This is, this is the, um, found, this is a foundational principle of um, the whole system of God versus the system of Satan, of where life comes from, how we receive it, and how that affects the relationships with people around us. Now, with, with that thought in mind, I, I just want to Move to Genesis chapter 12. We just want to spend a little bit of time looking at the blessing system. And again, how agape is central to, to the blessing system. Genesis chapter 12. Um, where are we up to? Ready? 12. Uh, 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, 
and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto the land that I shall show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay. So, God's, what's God saying to Abraham? I'll make of thee a great nation. Why? Why was God going to do this? Well, why did he bless him? I think he wanted to have a people. <coughs> but why did he choose him? Part of the channel of blessing? Yeah, part of the channel of blessing. But come back to Agape and Eros. Because of his, the pleasure of his goodwill. There wasn't anything good in him particularly. They went, oh, he's top of the glass. Off of him. Well, could it be that, not that it was in himself, could it be that he was most responded to Agape? He, God was reaching out to everybody. Mm. And Abraham responded to the invitation. Mm. <coughs> but that doesn't, it, we don't want to have any idea that God chose Abraham because were, he was good. He wasn't good. He was a pagan. He was a Babylonian. He, he'd come from idol worshippers. He was chosen out of an adulterous generation of people. Yeah. But the spirit was striving with him and, and he started responding. So the, and this is the, the principle of agape is that he said, I will make of you a great nation because God wanted to give this to him. I will bless you because I want to bless you. And this, this is the, the this is a re-establishing with the human race. It's a it's a repeat of what uh, God did with his son. Of course, his son uh, was was given all these things. There was no sin involved in this case, but but this is a, a, a copy of that process where God's agape is being poured out into the life of Abraham. I'm going to say something easy. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. It is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Enjoy. That's what he's doing here to Abraham. And he's also from the line of Shem, so he was using a, a line of people. So there's a connection there as well, isn't there? The point is we see God's agape here. His promises all these things to him. I will bless thee, and uh, uh, I will make, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now this is, uh, this is an amazing thing, and I. There's a number of different paths we could tread from this particular point, but um, when he says, I will bless thee, what's, what does this mean, that God would bless Abraham? What's the blessing? Happiness. Happiness, yeah. Blessing, happiness. I think his whole life, and his children, and his children, and his children, he's going to bless him for a period of time. Okay, so we're talking about a blessing coming to Abraham. And it's true. Yeah, it's an inheritance, a blessing of inheritance. And what's he inheriting? This is this is this is if we come if we come back to the, the Pentagon, how how we relate to this is gonna start coming into the law and the covenants. Um, blessing just in like what was it? Bestowal of grace or favor. Bestowal of grace. Uh, God gave him life. Gave him light, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Light, which is agape, error, but not eros. Yeah. I was going to say that. God's blessing is agape. Okay. C could we say that it was God's righteousness was the blessing that he received? The righteousness of Christ? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Is this the blessing that he received? <coughs> the, the, the reason I'm, I'm asking this question is because. Um, well, let's have a look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 
Galatians chapter 3. And verse 29. If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Uh, um, 16. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seed as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So many people see that the blessing that was promised to Abraham was the coming of Christ. And they say, so the blessing is when Christ came to the world. That was the blessing that was promised to Abraham. And coming through his bloodline. Yeah. Now, um, if, if that was the only blessing that Abraham received, then how could he say, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing? We just need to spend a little bit of time on this, because this is, this, this is important that we, we get a grip, a grip on this. Um, there's no, it's obvious that when Christ came, that was a blessing, that was a blessing. But Abraham himself was not alive to participate in that blessing that was to, that was, came what was it, 2,000 years later? And a long time later. So what was the blessing that Abraham was receiving in his day? What was the blessing he was receiving? For his seed to come. For the seed to come? But, but how was that a blessing to him? Well, God gave it to Abraham by promise, and then verse 19... Wherefore then serve the Lord. It was added because of transgression until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was obtained by Abraham of Media. So it was a promise given to Abraham. Okay. So um, come back to let's come back to Genesis chapter twelve. We'll tease this out a little bit. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. So someone that would bless Abraham would be blessed. And it goes on, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So was he talking about the family that he was promised, and the onwards? Families of the earth. Isn't that the channel that God gives it to Jesus? So He blesses Jesus and then Jesus um, blesses us. So if He's like, if Abraham is blessed, if, sorry, somebody blesses Him, they bless because of that. Isn't that the same as what we're blessed because of what the Father does to Jesus? Okay. Yeah, okay. I think we're I think we're on the right track. Is it the continuation of the seed of the woman? Is that the, the continuation of the seed of the woman. And now we come to the question, what allows the continuation of the seed of the woman to exist? Covenant? Covenant? Obedience to the covenant. Obedience. So as in like it says that Abraham kept my statutes and judgments. Okay, statutes and judgments come into it. Which then brings you into Deuteronomy, you know, the blessings and the cursings. You know, okay. if we keep his law, we'll receive the blessing. And all of this is important in terms of um, Genesis 18. Verses 18. But if we keep the law in the covenant, doesn't that then come back to that you can do it within yourself as opposed to that it's coming to yourself? Well, it depends what you understand, keep. Yeah. Keep is it? All right, yeah. It depends on where your life source is when you're saying that. Genesis 18. What happens in Genesis 18 is that <coughs> Sodom is about to be destroyed. Why is Sodom going to be destroyed? What happened? What happened to the morality of the place? There was a bit. What, morality is a breakdown of relationship, isn't it? It's a breakdown of family relationship. 
There, there was the only way that the seed of the woman could survive is if families could continue to exist patterned after God and His Son. If families cease to do, to live in the pattern of God and His Son, of headship and submission, there would be no line. There would be nothing left. This is, this is one of the most fundamental thoughts that came into my mind. It's like, we talk about Jesus being born, but if the line, if the line of the Israelites had not in some way survived with a, a channel of blessing system, they would have been wiped off the map like Sodom and Gomorrah. They should have been wiped off the map. But when, when human relationships become so confused and twisted, uh, and they start having child sacrifice, and they start having incest, and all these kinds of problems, that society is finished. And, the, 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 and if that had happened to Israel completely, they had completely lost their way, they would have been wiped off, no seed would have come. Could have come, if Satan had succeeded in totally converting Israel. So, what, uh, let's have a look at verse 18 and 19. He says, well, he says, um, verse 17, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And then he says, For I know him that he will what? And his household after him. Here is the secret of guaranteeing that the seed would be able to come. If Abraham didn't command his family and his children after him in the way of the Lord, the family unit would be dismantled, and that would destroy the bloodline. That would destroy the sea. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we see the parallel to this in the New Testament. In the New Testament, what are the qualifications for an elder? 1 Timothy 3.5 1 Timothy 3.5 Four and five. We have two. We have two. Kirsty. It's all right. We're not performance based. <laughs> Three, four, and five. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that rules well his own household, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church? And here we come to the very key. For if a man not know not how to take care of his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Did Abraham know how to take care of his family? Mm -hmm. This is the key. Mm -hmm. This is this is the absolute key. Install the law in them. Hmm? Install the law in them. So yeah. In their way. And this is this is the way this is the way that God did it. And it's patterned after God and his son. Is that God gave to Abraham everything. Gave him the kingdom, you'll be a great nation, you will be... He did for him what he did for his son. And so, um, God, Abraham. Now, what made Abraham a blessed man is that he accepted what? Except what God said. Which means he submitted. He placed himself in submission to God. And he believed what God had said. And that made him a blessed man. And this is this is the crucial. Then, then because he was given everything. Because he was blessed. He was his heart was filled with agape because of, of this process. He then replicated that in passing it on to Sarah. Now we might think, well, hang on a minute, 
There's a few hiccups along the way. There's a few hiccups along, thank you. There's a few hiccups. <laughs> we had a, we had a, the Agape had a little bit of a hiccup on the way. But we notice what does Sarah, this is, this is the principle of the family structure. What does Sarah call her husband? Lord. Lord. My Lord. My Lord. Master. That sounds so wrong. Especially in today's world. Huh? Especially in today's world. Yeah. It says that we are to do exactly the same. But it sounds like an incredible blessing if you're, if you're a wife and you want, you know, Sarah, I think Sarah would be incredibly blessed in that because she's receiving directly from the father through her husband. So she's receiving everything. Isn't she? She's receiving the love, the instruction, the nurturing, the guidance. She's commanding the, the family. So, so, so now we're so now we're moving into a kingdom that's different to independent life source. Mm -hmm. We're moving into a channel, and that's that's why the channel of blessing. Mm -hmm. You're moving into a system now where you're seeing blessing coming through from. Father is ahead of Christ, Christ is ahead of the man, man is ahead of woman. There is a channel of blessing. It's not the only channel of blessing, but it's one of the most powerful channels of blessing. Is receiving any different to inheritance? Is receiving. Any different to inheritance? Inheriting. Anybody can receive, but they don't. Not everybody can. Like in an earthly style, like, hmm. I can so receive I'm something, just, but you're, you're I'm just child. toying with the idea that Abraham is inheriting a blessing yes. from God. Yes. Like Jesus inherited exactly. a blessing. Exactly. And he, the blessing is coming down again to Sarah. She's inheriting a blessing, not just receiving it. Exactly. Now you're on to it. Through the same that, that as Christ received a blessing from his father, and, and he said, Amen, Father, and it was counted unto Christ for righteousness. He says, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And Christ believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's the foundation. But you have to believe in a begotten son to believe that principle. Because the unbegotten <coughs> son doesn't receive anything from the Father. There is no inheritance. There's nothing to give. He's already, he's already got it. Why do you give him something when he's already got it? So this, this principle is being repeated. And that's why 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 11, 3 God is the head of all. Well, let's, let's just read it. It's always good to see the black and the white. And I, I'm, hopefully we're, we're moving slowly onto an understanding of the gospel that is very, very different. Very, very much family based as a channel of blessing. 1 Corinthians 11. You two, if you got that, 3. Yeah. But I would have you known that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's the channel of blessing. And when we think of the word head, now, now in if if God is the one that has life, and He's flowing that life down to Abraham. And Abraham doesn't have life. He's just receiving it from God. Okay? So he doesn't have life. And he's just passing it on to his wife. The same going down. And how does he pass it on to his wife? Through his words. Through his words. What did God say to his son? You are my beloved son. So Abraham says to his wife, you are my princess. That's what Sarah means, isn't it? You're my cherished one. Speaks words. He is a protector for her. He is a provider for her. He not only uses words, he backs it up with uh, caring for his family. And in that first Corinthians 3 that we read, um, verse 7 says, For a man is able to not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. And that's the um, reflection. Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. The woman is the brightness of the man's glory. 
This is this is the same principle that's occurring here. But if we have then we have a lie, and Sarah has her own life source, and then she's stuck in this very all of a sudden she's it's feeling very restrictive down here because hey I've got my own life and I don't need to be stuck under you blokes. So I'm going to step out here, so I can be free. You, you see how the lie destroys the channel and it, it, it busts. The agape system, it pulls the whole channel apart. Which is why we have all these troubles about women and ministry and women in work. You know, you should, women should just stay home and be um, mothers and wives. They need to be out there because they have their own life source. They have to show that they're yeah. independent, that they have something. So it, it's, it's destroying the system. <coughs> And so the, the fundamental thing that we want to look about the, the Abraham and Sarah relationship is this, this with, despite the hiccups that were occurring, Sarah and Abraham would, were, the, were reflecting in their family the father-son relationship. Man was made in the image of God. God said to his son, let us, you and me, make man, Adam and Eve, in our image. And when that relationship is correctly aligned, there is a channel of blessing. Remember we talked about when the sun and the moon align with the earth, the gravitational pull on the earth creates greater movement of water upon the earth. That's the principle. When there's a correct alignment, we get greater blessing occurring. And, and thus, the greater blessing, and a picture of when Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac. Same principle. Isaac submitted. He submitted himself. And so it's the it's the headship submission relationship that exists between husband and wife. Headship not to dominate, headship to bless. Uh, and submission in order to and this is this is the whole we come back to Genesis chapter twelve and then we'll wrap it up. Genesis chapter 12, he says, I will make your name great, verse 2. How could, how could God make Abraham's name great? This is where we come to the question of how much authority did Abraham have in his family? He was the leader. He was it. He was the head, but... But how much authority did he have? Well, God gave him the authority. So yeah. then he had authority he over everybody. He only gave what Sarah could He only had as much authority as Sarah gave him. Yeah. <coughs> because she, she diverted the plan. She diverted the blessing herself. Because she, she is the number two person in the whole family system. And with all the servants and everything like that, and if they're sitting around the campfire, and Abraham says to his wife, can you get that for me? Get it yourself. All the servants go, oh, that's how you treat Abraham. Well, she's the number two, isn't she? So that's how you treat him. His authority's gone. But if she says, uh, yes, my lord, they're all like, okay, whoa, okay, well, that's how it works. Which is why Vashti was got rid of the rest. Because they didn't want that same when Vashti when Vashti was called that she wouldn't come. And they said, Oh we can't have this happening because of all the other Yeah, they were gonna rise up and yeah. it'll mess our families up. Vashti's gone. You got used to it. So this is this is a, a really, really important principle. How much authority does the father have? As much as the son will give you. And that's why he has, he has absolute and complete and total authority because that's what the Son gives to him. And it's beautiful. That's why in Christ all things hold together. That's why in the position of, of Sarah, Sarah is the one who made Abraham's name great. The spirit of submission that we see in Isaac is attributed partly and in a large way to Abraham, but if Sarah did not respect her husband, 
Isaac would not have been the boy that he was. And even when there was further hiccups with Abraham and Sarah, when he said, just say you're my sister, I know it's sort of right, and he did it not once but twice, she submitted, even though it put her in danger, she still submitted. She did, didn't she? She submitted to her. And through the channel, God made sure she was right. Because right. yeah. she could have said to him, you're worried about getting killed and you're going to throw me into the Pharaoh's harem. I mean, what kind of husband are you? I mean, thanks a lot, buddy. She could have said that. <laughs> well, it's true, wasn't it? He's worried he's going to die. She so has to get put in this harem. Well, it's going to be worse than death, wouldn't it? It's a better lifestyle for us. Sorry? It's a better lifestyle than dying, mate. <laughs> oh, get pampered for one purpose. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the, the, where the whole system sort of destroyed. The Gun of Light says that Lucifer was the third, third in the kingdom and he refused to subject himself to Christ. And the other angels followed him. And then Adam and Eve yeah. followed him. Exactly. The third one in the kingdom. That's an interesting point. It just, it, it just started to infect the whole system in terms of the channel. So the, the elder son and how his effect on the younger children. This, this, to keep this channel system operating and going, it has to operate on this headship and submission principle. This is, and we're going to come back to this again and again. Uh, and when we look at the divine pattern, uh, where in the Greek it's ek and dia. Ek is the word for of whom, dear is the word for by whom or channel. They're the two Greek words that keep this system together. But Satan wanted to destroy this and say, no, I will ascend, I will be light, and then there'll be conflict and there'll be attraction and repulsion taking place. That's the system that he set up. And so what I'm suggesting to you is the blessing that was given to Abraham was not only the fact that Christ would come down the track. It's the fact that God gave, he gave a blessing to Abraham. And that blessing of agape that was poured upon him, he poured it upon his family. And a family structure was created that would preserve the Jewish line until Jesus could come. That there could be a, a Mary and there could be a Joseph who would be able to raise Jesus in the Torah and help him to understand these things in after a godly fashion and a spirit of submission. When she says, behold the handmaid of the Lord, that's the spirit of Sarah in submission. I think that's your previous picture when you had the, the male and the female, the, the two, yep. and they were, you'd drawn them like that. Yeah. Where if you move that one back down to here, exactly. there we have the father and son. This is how it this should be. Is, this that's is the point. The Bible teaches that. When you have it up like this, one is ascending yeah. to take a position of what Satan wants. That's what he wants. It's, it's the mind of Satan. It's restless modern ease, as we say. But also uh, foolish, hapless atoms who uh, let their wives wander off. Uh, but uh, so the, the blessing, and, and I, I want to just tie this off in terms of many people believe that the blessing came to, to the human race when Christ came, but the blessing came to Abraham. In Abraham there was a blessing. And the model of his family is the blessing system. And this is where we read Adventist Home, page 15. Adventist, very first paragraph. The success of the church, the community, and the nation depend upon home influences. And this is because Sarah understands that her husband is blessed. Now, Sarah, in her own life and in her own way, she can receive blessings directly from the Father. Of course she can. In her reading of the Word, in her study of the Bible, in her prayer life, she's receiving direct blessings. But then there's a multiplier effect that she knows that her husband has received a blessing, and if she places herself in submission to him, she will get a double portion. She, she, in submitting to him, she will get a magnification of that blessing principle that has been given to Abraham. 
Sarah learns to draw from the well of her husband. She has a belief. She has a belief that God has blessed her husband. And she acts towards him, believing that her husband is blessed. And in submitting to him, she will be blessed. You see? But that takes an act of faith. So what, what does a woman do when her husband's an absolute moron? Right, what Edith did. She still respected him. You're a moron, I'll take over. <laughs> what do you do with morons? Get out of the way. And that's the, <laughs> that's the epidemic of women these days. Yeah. You know what? No longer, Jack. <laughs> Move over. I'll drive now. Well, what does that do? I will ascend. Yes. And you get one grumpy man. It can become very violent. Yes, it becomes a very contentious situation when that when that happens. Abigail, that's why in Divine Pattern we write about Abigail, Hannah, how to deal with a churlish man. One of the hardest assignments on the face of the planet. How to deal with a churlish man. Uh, and uh, Abigail teaches us, she shows us the Spirit of Christ in such a tremendous way. Uh, to restore this, she submitted to her husband and continued the channel of blessing. And of course, in the case of where it was Nabal, and, and God sent a blessing and Nabal wouldn't give it to Sarah, well, God unblocked the channel, didn't he? That's Isaiah 54 verse 5. For they make her as thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth. Amen. Amen. So we've covered a we've covered a few points there in dealing with the lie of the serpent, the doctrine of immortality, how this affects the family unit. Uh, this is what this is where we want to go. Uh, and I've just touched briefly on the law and the covenants. Because I, I just reiterate again that many people that the blessing that Abraham received, most people believe didn't actually, Abraham never got it. He was dead long before Christ arrived, therefore he didn't receive a blessing. But his name was made great and all of those things. And we now look up to him. And, but no, Abraham received a blessing in his very day. He was blessed with righteousness by faith, the agape, and that helped to establish a family structure, a family system, where a channel of blessing could open up so that the family of Abraham would ha have a, a group of men rise up who would bless their wives, would praise their wives in the gate, would speak words of blessing over their children, wives discerning a blessing in their husbands and submitting to their husbands to both nurture them and to ensure that blessing would be given to their children. She would draw blessings out of her husband to be given to the children. And that's where we see the little children bringing, their, uh, the, the mothers bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed. Even though Jesus wasn't there, the Spirit was still with Abraham. God. Sorry? Even though Jesus wasn't there, it didn't come to later, and you were saying that Abraham had that, the Spirit was with him. The Spirit of who? The Spirit of the Father. And of the, Son. the Spirit of Jesus. Yeah. It was still there. So this is, this is the invisible visible. Yeah. But in but the Old Testament, Christ was there. Christ was with Abraham. Uh, and just a, a bit of a deep concept. Christ is in, in Genesis 3, he's the seed. Well, and, and Abraham is part of the church, and the church is the woman. So where's the seed in the Old Testament? Where does, how does a woman carry a seed? It's internally. So Christ was in Abraham, in Sarah. He was there. And then he manifested 2,000 years ago and was, came out of the church. Revelation chapter 12. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, it's very interesting that submission on the part of Sarah was done from a position of power, not from weakness. Mm -hmm. exactly. she hold, she's holding herself in a position of strength and, and power in order to honour and submit, not from weakness and reluctance. No. It's a gift that she is it, giving. It has to be a choice. It has to be a completely voluntary choice. It cannot be forced. 
And anyway, agape does not force. Mm -hmm. Only eros forces. So the concept of headship that most people have is dominance. Mm -hmm. But dominance comes from the lie that, that, mm -hmm. that this life source here has to dominate and force down this life source mm -hmm. so that the woman becomes a battered wife. She has no choice but to submit. She has, and, and no kingdom will ever be built on that system. You cannot, it's, there's no freedom in that. And if the wife is not free, the children are not free, they're all in bondage, and, and it's not going to work. I suppose uh, the sun, this UN, it gives energy that uh, you know, plants turn towards it, so it inspires. Yeah, inspiring uh, the children, inspiring the wife to, to do this, to, to, yeah, to respond. But like with Christ, Christ is given to have life in himself. He's actively choosing every moment of every day to submit to his Father. It's a, it's, it's a choice from a position of power. But in, in offering that position uh, to, to Abraham, she, she is the one that holds the kingdom together. Because she then becomes the firstborn of all the rest. She sets the tone for the family. That's what's so powerful. That's why Christ has a name above every name in that, in that capacity. And it's a beautiful system and we'll keep unlocking this. And we better finish there. So, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for uh, the opportunity to study some of these things about life and where it comes from and how it affects our thinking about our relationships and how we relate to one another, especially as husbands and wives and uh, parents and children. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to come into that blessing process. We're in the position where we need to submit, and all of us are in a position where we need to submit. And uh, those of us who have positions of leadership and authority, that we will be responsible with our blessing and our care and our protection to do the right thing, to be honourable and care for those under our, uh, under our care. And we just pray for a good night of rest tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.